afternoon and welcome. Thank you so much for participating this afternoon. My name is Rita Villa and along with Scarlett Reyes from the Communications Engagement and Education team, I'll be your host this evening. Tonight, you will hear from our panelists made up of members from the Legislative Council. You will also meet David Blunt, Clerk of the Parliaments and Clerk of the Legislative Council. During the presentation, you will have the opportunity to ask questions via the chat function, and we will endeavour to answer as many of those questions as possible in the time we have. Before we commence, however, we have a few words from the President of the Legislative Council, the Honourable Matthew Mason Cox. Look, uh, thank you very much, Rita, and uh, welcome everybody. Good evening. It's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land upon which Parliament sits, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and uh, give you a bit of an understanding of what my role is as President of the Legislative Council. Um, I'm here to really preside over the House to try and maintain order and indeed to ensure that the practices and the procedures of the House are at all times uh, observed. Um, I must say the crossbench is an, an important part of that uh, and some might say at times they're, they're a little unruly. I wouldn't say that of course but they are an integral component of the House and indeed very much the essence of a house of review <coughs> and ensuring that the house is performing its constitutional role in holding the executive to account so tonight the spotlight is on them the crossbench and uh, it gives me great pleasure to point out to you that there are 11 crossbenches in the legislative council out of a total of 42 members uh, the government has 17 members in the upper house and needs a majority to pass any legislation. So if the opposition isn't agreeing with the government, which does happen a lot, but if it doesn't, then the government needs four members out of those 11 members of the crossbench to actually pass its legislation. So tonight we're going to be meeting some of those key crossbenches. Uh, we have uh, a range of them here for you, but before I introduce them, I want to talk about that the role that they'll play in the upper house and indeed they'll reflect upon just how they go about their business and uh, how they perform that role as members of their particular parties and in and how that negotiation processes works with the government of the day in terms of legislation as it comes to the house so with uh with those few words may i introduce uh first of all Kate Fairman from the Greens, who is that wonderful green background, which is most appropriate. Uh, the Honourable Mark Latham from One Nation, uh, who has the uh, the wonderful books behind him. And of course, uh, the Honourable Robert Borzok from the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party, who has uh, that uh, vehicle behind him out on safari somewhere. Um, so thank you all for making yourselves available tonight, and I'm very much looking forward to um, your reflections on the role of the crossbench. Uh, I also would like to introduce our co-host co this evening, uh, David um, Blunt, the Clerk of the Parliaments. Now, David was appointed as Clerk of the Parliaments in October 2011, and it's his role to provide members with support on matters like procedure and practices of the House and his advice and support of members is highly valued. So it's wonderful to have you here tonight with us too, David. Look, I sincerely hope you enjoy tonight's discussion. And I think uh, it's a great opportunity to hear firsthand by the, from some of the dealers and the operators in the upper house. And I, I, I trust that you learn a few things from all of that. So with those few words, Rita, I'll pass back to you. Thank you very much for your warm welcome, Mr. President. I too would like to acknowledge elders past, present and future and welcome Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have joined us tonight. I hope everyone in our audience will enjoy our program and I will just take a moment to remind everyone to ask questions in the chat again. We also have the Clerk of Parliaments and Clerk of the Legislative Council, David Blunt, with us. Good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome those who are joining us on uh, YouTube. It's great to have you with us, and it's great to be here with uh, the members of the Legislative Council, and thank you, Rita, for that welcome. Um, 
I must say that I've seen many changes in the Legislative Council over the 30 years that I've worked in this place. Um, I've seen the crossbench grow from uh, four members back in 1990 when I started to as many as 13 members in 1999. And now, as Mr. President uh, reminded us, 11 members. Um, but what has remained the same in all that time is that every day I witness the crossbench members influencing political outcomes, improving legislation and holding the executive government to account. And we're indeed privileged tonight to have three of them with us uh, who can share us share with us uh, their personal insights. So to kick off, I'd like to, um, and, and just to, uh, noting to the members, I think I'll take things in alphabetical order if I can. So I'll start with Mr. Borzak. Um, can we start with just uh, some words of introduction? Can I ask you to introduce yourselves? Tell us a little bit about your story. How is it that your journeys brought you to become a member of the Legislative Council and indeed a crossbench member in the Legislative Council. So Mr. Borzak, then Ms. Fairman and then Mr. Latham. Mm, no, thanks very much, David. Uh, yeah, my, my involvement, of course, is uh, as a representative and the leader of the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. And uh, we have two two members, myself and my colleague, uh, Mark Banasiak in the upper house and three in the lower house. Now, my journey, I suppose, is a long and torturous one, uh, starting back in as far back as in the 80s when it related to gun laws, but also uh, when the party was incorporated in 1992. Uh, I was chairman of the party when in 1995 when John Tingle, our first member, was elected. Um, we had our second member elected in 2007. Uh, and uh, actually, sorry, John Tingle retired in 2006. Uh, we had our second member elected in 2007 and for my sins, from about 2006 through to 2010, I was chairman of the party a second time. There had been a gap there, thank goodness. And uh, what happened suddenly um, was that uh, poor old Roy Smith, our second member, uh, died suddenly in, in office in 2010. And um, the party asked me to take over his position. Um, I was actually retired at that time. I'd actually retired from full-time work in 2002. Um, so I decided to take the challenge on, and uh, it's been a challenge uh, for us. Uh, we've uh, morphed from just the Shooters Party to the Shooters and Fishers Party, and then in 2016 uh, we became the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party. And 2016 was also the year that we won our first lower house seat uh, at the Orange by-election, and then 2019 we retained that seat with a, a massive swing our way, and then picked up another two seats, the seat of Barwon and the seat of Murray. And uh, that's how we ended up with three in the lower house. My, um, It's been an interesting ride for me uh, in the last uh, 11, 11 years, uh, tail end of the Labor, Labor 16 year long Labor uh, government that ran from 1995 till 2011. Um, and now we've had since 2011 right up until will be hopefully for them until March 2023, a um, coalition government. And so our party has lived, I suppose, under both regimes, a Labor government for 16 years and so far a uh, Liberal National Coalition government. Um, yeah, I, I, I could say a lot more, but that's my journey and that's how I've got to where I am and uh, happy to uh, answer any questions or discuss anything further. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Borzak. Um, Ms. Fairman. Thanks, David. Hi, everybody. Um, great to be able to be here and chat to you in a what is I still see, I still consider a very weird format where we are talking to an unknown audience. And um, but it is wonderful uh, still to be able to to do this and to be able to have done a lot of virtual meetings during COVID. So thanks for tuning in. So I'm Kate Fairman. I'm a Greens member of the Legislative Council. We have three members in the Legislative Council 
and we have three members in the lower house in the legislative assembly. So um, a quick, just a quick kind of snapshot of of why I'm kind of uh, where I am, I suppose, a little bit about um, my personal journey. I started getting kind of active and involved in social justice issues and environmental issues for quite some time during my university days, I have to say, although my environmental kind of bent started, I think as many people who are really kind of passionate about environmental issues started as a kid, um, basically growing up in country Queensland, kind of in the bush, was really, you know, into animals, all that kind of stuff. So it wasn't until though that I really got involved politically. It was like it was about 2000, the late 90s and 2000. It was around the time where there was a lot of focus on Tassie's forests. I got involved in the Greens at that time because of what I think a lot of people who talk about getting into this party at some stage, um, Bob Brown, when he was doing a lot on forests, then of course the period with the Greens when he stood up for the Tampa refugees, I was kind of working, this was in 2001 for those of you who weren't political or watching the news back then, 2001 was quite an um, interesting time for our party because that's when we tended to get, to get a lot of people leaving the Labor Party who were disappointed in Labor. Anyway, I was very very active in the party in terms of I started off when I was living in Adelaide for a bit. I did a lot of campaign management and media management in the party up until the point I then came to New South Wales, was only going to be here temporarily, ended up meeting a partner who I'm still with uh, during that campaign. And we I worked for Lee Rhiannon, who was a uh, Greens MP as well as her media advisor. I have also done a range of different, um, uh, I was uh, the CEO of the Nature Conservation Council and have been active in organisations such as Get Up when they first um, formed. I was one of their founding directors. So a history, if you like, of campaigning, which what is what um, led me to this position. It's interesting, I have to say, that I think a lot of people, you seem to have, um, there are people who kind of bring a legal bent, if you like, and a kind of law focus to the job. I come from a very different, um, very different background, which is really uh, media communications and campaigning. So it, it's uh, sometimes I wish I had a law degree um, when, <laughs> but uh, I think this is also, um, yeah, I think it's also been extremely useful to have that that kind of background. So I'll leave it there because I know we've got lots more questions. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, Ms. Fairman. Uh, Mr. Latham. Uh, thanks, David, and uh, everyone who's um, who's watching on. Um, uh, I suppose my story uh, started in local and then federal uh, politics uh, with the ALP uh, from 2005 to the last state election. I had a long time out of uh, parliamentary service, but in that time, uh, raising children, I'd always taken a very strong interest in uh, school education as an issue. Uh, I became increasingly concerned about where the school system in New South Wales is headed and uh, um, the, the state government, of course, uh, runs 2,200 schools and has legislation for the non-government system as well. So that was my main motivation in re rejoining uh, or trying to rejoin by election uh, parliamentary service and uh, to specialise as much as possible on school education um, as a representative of uh, One Nation, where my colleague Rod Roberts was uh, elected with us, um, with me um, in March of 2019. And uh, while education remains a very important issue, you know, we try to work on a, a range of uh, matters, economic policy, employment policy, energy policy, um, some of the, the, the legal issues that come up and Rod Roberts from his policing background takes a very close interest in law and order. So um, it's been a good experience so far, the what, two and a half years, a bit more than that, on the uh, crossbench in the upper house and uh, looking forward to next year and continuing all the work we do, the research, the policy advocacy, uh, working as best we can to influence legislation and outcomes where you know, there's a lot of scope in the Legislative Council to do that. So it's all up to the crossbench members, uh, how they get about their work. And um, we look forward to, uh, you know, continue, continuing that 
the next election and beyond. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Latham, and thanks for those introductions to each of you. Mr. Latham, can I just pick up on something you finished with there and pose this question to all three of you, but perhaps starting with you, Mr. Latham, what do you find to be the key to getting things done in the upper house? Well, you need to have a sympathetic uh, minister, for one, who, who might be in tune with your thinking and policy advocacy. But I think uh, expertise matters. Uh, when I was in the federal parliament, I was there for 11 years. Uh, it was a feature of the parliament that uh, members would, a fair proportion of the members would try and specialise in different policy areas. And that always gives you the advantage of uh, developing some extra knowledge, expertise, uh, knowing some things that um, others don't necessarily get across in a busy parliamentary life and being able to uh, match, say, public servants with their specialised knowledge. And I think this is true in the federal parliament now and, and, and certainly true in the state parliament that probably in the age of social media and the accelerated um, conventional and social media cycle, we haven't got as many uh, uh, people as expert uh, specialising in certain policy areas. So I, I think that matters a, a fair bit. Uh, that's very helpful, along with your advocacy skills and timing, you know, um, in the negotiations and some of the weird and wonderful uh, flow of amendments and possibilities in the upper house, you've really got to have good tactics, strategy, you know, strategic thinking and good timing to uh, know when to strike. Thank you. Um, Ms. Fairman, would you like to have a go at that? What uh, what have you found to be the key to getting things done? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't think you can um, just avoid the obvious, which is numbers, really, firstly. So, and that, that comes down to relationships as well. I've been in the parliament for, for two, two different times. So I failed to, didn't mention this at the beginning, but was there from 2010 through to 2013 when I resigned to run for the Senate for the Greens as a lead candidate in 2013. We didn't get somebody elected that um, year. So I then worked for Richard Di Natale as his chief of staff and then uh, came back to fill a casual, to, a, to run for pre-selection and fill a casual vacancy left by Maureen Faruqi, who is now the senator um, and I filled her position again in um, 2018. So those two times we have seen quite a different, um, uh, the first time I have been used to being in the chamber when um, it, when we kind of weren't able to get as much business through, it was much more difficult. Um, I don't think there was, um, to be honest, it, to, be, to be blunt, it all depends in some ways which minor party or members of the crossbench will choose to work with the government or against the government. Um, and I think this time is uh, different. I'll allow, allow um, if uh, Mr. Borzak wants to, to, to talk about that in any way, but this is quite different to what it was, um, what it was a few years ago. So numbers and what do numbers mean? Of course, that also means relationships. So we can get things done, which of course is probably why David Blunt looks so, um, if you, David, you don't look tired, but you actually should be exhausted <laughs> because of uh, the amount of work that we are throwing your way and to the secretariat, the committee secretariats, because we are able to, um, by we, most of the crossbench as well as Labor, are kind of teaming together to, to get a lot of our business done. So this time in the last few years, it really has been in some ways, if we all want to work together to for our own business um, uh, and against the government, if we have the numbers, which we do at the moment, then that's what we're able to do. Who knows what's going to happen after March 2023? Maybe that will mean that um, the Secretariat and the, the uh, procedures and the clerks, uh, you, David, and everybody, all the good people that work uh, with you will have more of a rest. Who knows? We may only have another year of being able to do what we're able to do, but I tell you what, we, we're getting, there is a lot of business coming out of the Legislative Council because the unlikely, you know, Robert Borzak, the Shooters, the Greens, Labor, One Nation to some extent, we, if we think that something is going to be good for transparency, good for democracy, usually we are working together to make it happen, which is a positive story. Um, Mr. Borzak, that sounds like a, a really good intro to you. How, how did this come about? 
Uh, I might, um, having been there, as I said earlier, from two th late 2010 and then th with this government from the election in 2011, um, what Kate was referring to there, of course, is it all is a numbers game, obviously. Um, and when the coalition government came to power in t 2011 for that first four years till 2015, effectively on most of the things that ha were happening in the place uh, between the government and the opposition, and the crossbench, um, we, we, our party, I suppose, on a lot of occasions had what we'd call the balance of power. In other words, we had a casting vote on what might or might not happen. Um, so it was really up to the government to tr see whether they really wanted to work with us, but it didn't take them long to work out that they didn't want to work with us. And uh, certainly, um, I won't go through all the gory details now, but we had a rather base falling out with them, or they had a base falling out with us. And um, so really, the majority of that first four-year term, where the government could have been a little bit better at working with the cross, which is a little bit more flexible, perhaps they weren't. And uh, uh, between the 2015 election and the 2019 election, um, well, the way the numbers worked out is that um, we didn't uh, have the balance of power. Um, I think, in fact, the Christian Democrats ended up with it. And so in that period of time, um, the government just spent their time completely ignoring our party on the crossbench and um, you know I, I think Kate would say the same completely ignoring them I don't think you, they would have they wouldn't have a conversation with us from one month to the next because they could largely negotiate what they wanted uh, through the upper house with the help of the t then two Christian Democrats and now there's one and then from 2019 till now um, we uh, came out of the 2019 election with um, one nation being elected um, I guess on our side of politics, um, we were renewed with what we had. Um, I suppose it's really, to a degree, uh, an opportunity came about with the way the numbers worked. That um, if we could, if the crossbenchers could negotiate with the with the opposition, um, we could uh, perhaps, I would think, modernise or make the upper house more effective in its scrutiny, role of scrutiny and transparency, uh, scrutiny of government and transparency of government operations. And uh, again, without going through all the gory detail, there'd been a fair bit of thought put into what we might or might be able to do if the opportunity arose and the stars aligned after the 2019 election. And um, I had discussions with Labor, I had discussions with the Greens, I had discussions with One Nation, and we had the numbers then to start putting in place some pretty substantial changes to uh, what we call the, the, uh, the sessional orders for this current uh, four-year term from 2019 to 2023. And again, there's, uh, that required a, a landmark level of cooperation between the crossbenchers, which we're still seeing today. And I think that's what Kate was referring to uh, with, uh, with you, David, that uh, what little hair you've got left, uh, maybe by the end of this term, you won't have any left at all. Um, but a lot of those uh, experiments in changes, uh, I think have worked out very well. Um, I think there's a couple of small things I'd rather change. Uh, for example, the uh, the second supplementary question I'd like to see dumped. Uh, I'll talk about that at some stage, but um, uh, only because it takes up a lot of extra time. The uh, the opposition sort of tends to abuse that privilege a little bit uh, and takes up crossbench time for questions. But um, really, really, we're sort of going through a, a very purple patch in terms of um, the crossbench in the upper house, uh, where we're working very closely I wouldn't, sorry, I wouldn't say very closely, we're working together cooperatively to maximise our opportunity at holding the government to account. And I suppose the daily, um, the daily most obvious thing that you see is the number of Standing Order 52s that are coming through. And I think we've done more Standing Order 52s on, uh, on water, uh, water and water issues alone uh, than, uh, than the whole of all SO52s in the previous parliament from 14 to uh, to nine uh, sorry from 15 to 19 so um, it's it's a very very uh, I don't like to, like to use the word litigious but it's a very very active crossbench and quite often um, I'm sure the Greens Kate would hold a nose at some of the, some of the things that she ticks off for us um, uh, I'm sure to a lesser degree marks the same he uh, he, he would like to see that, certain things not go out on SO52 because there might be things in there that would advantage uh, other crossbench parties. Keep in mind that we are still in com competition with one another, 
But the overriding benefit of holding the government account is really what drives us forward. And I think um, overall, I, I mean, it's, this parliament is just so different to what it was when I first came in to see John Tingle operating in there in 1950, 1952, 1995. Um, and, uh, and now it's just uh, fantastic to see. And the new president, I think, is really quite happy with the way things are going. And uh, uh, we're just going through a process now of converting those uh, sessional orders where we think they're, it's appropriate and turning them into permanent standing orders so they don't have to be renewed every, every four years. Um, I think that's enough from me. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much. Um, another question for all three of you. Um, how do you balance pursuing your own agenda and that of your own political party with the broader public interest? And you've all talked about giving the government a hard time and holding the government to account. How does the concept of the government's mandate affect the work of the upper house? Um, who would like to start there? Mr. Latham. Uh, yeah, thanks, David. Uh, I, I've reached the conclusion that, that one of the um, uh, characteristics, I think it's a beneficial characteristic of the crossbench is that what we advance in the chamber and more broadly uh, in other public forums is very much consistent with what our voters would um, um, see our parties as representing, um, you know, across the spectrum. And obviously there's a wide ideological spectrum there, but I think the crossbench tends to be more authentic. Um, it um, has representatives who are articulating views that our voters would uh, very much identify with and think, oh, that's what our particular uh, uh, minor party should be on about. Whereas, you know, it's my observation that um, Liberal and National Party these days are way to the left of what your average Liberal and National Party voter would think of, um, of, of their party and what they thought they were voting for at the last election. And same with the Labor Party, or pro although probably not to quite the same degree. So I, I think uh, there's an authenticity on the crossbench uh, where we're true not only do our beliefs, but also our party beliefs and promises and policies that were put out at the last election, whereas the the, the, the major parties, um, the reality of, of how the state parliament works, it's not really a representative parliament when you look at the, the things that the major parties um, uh, develop, because you can be certain, absolutely certain, they're, they're to the left of mainstream opinion and values in New South Wales electorate. So I don't think we've got much of a challenge there. And I tend to think one of the interesting aspects of future elections is how long will voters of those major parties sort of um, be, 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 be conned or have the wool pulled over their eyes as to what they're actually voting for? I can jump Ms. in Simmons. if you want. Yes. Yeah. So interesting language, I think, in terms of government mandate, because I think it would be a government mandate of the, the, the government may have a mandate if there was just sweeping support for the government in both the fair for, for the government in terms of votes in both the lower house and the upper house. And of course, we know that potentially, right? So maybe the WA election may have seen a government mandate, for example, in terms of how many seats Labor won in, in that election. However, here in New South Wales, we obviously have, and very importantly, there are um, the there's the legislative council vote and the LA vote. And for, as far as Greens voters go, we know that there's quite a lot of them that get the difference between the two houses and choose to use their vote differently in both houses. So, for example, we get, say, you know, a significant number of people who um, our voters may vote Labor in the lower house and they'll very deliberately vote for the Greens. We also get people who vote for Liberal National uh, in the lower house, sometimes even a couple of very, very strange One Nation uh, in the lower house and then they'll vote Greens. <laughs> they'll vote Greens in the upper house. But um, that is for a reason. I, um, obviously, the even if the 
even if the voters choose, when they choose a government, they haven't chosen the um, makeup of the Legislative um, Council or the Upper House generally to reflect that. So we are there to absolutely put a, um, you know, a bit of a break on a sweeping government mandate. We are there so that we can assess all of the legislation that comes before us, that we can move amendments, that we can go back to the minister responsible and say, hey, you haven't, um, have you thought of this or this or this? We've spoken with this community group who hasn't been consulted, for example, who um, uh, would like to see this or they're a really key stakeholder. So um, we, yeah, we uh, play a very important role doing that. I see for the Greens particularly, and I think it, I think Mark was right as well in terms of um, uh, saying that we largely are kind of representing the people who vote for us. Um, I do think, you know, I'm sure all of us will say this, that when we bring things forward, it is in the public interest. Um, we are there often for the community. And from the Greens perspective, really, we say also those people, sorry, also those things that can't vote, but we need to be thinking of the environment and thinking of wildlife and what have you when we make decisions and we kind of see our our vote being for that as well i think in future generations or all of all of that so yeah it's important for us we believe that our policies largely which go through a really really full on process in the greens in terms of consulting with stakeholders and members and it's a really laborious sometimes some might say too democratic grassroots democratic process we ultimately i believe come up with policies that we then take to the parliament that do reflect the public interest and environmental interest most of the time yeah uh, all of the time i i probably should say thank you uh, mr borzak yeah, I, I, I don't um, don't disagree with the two previous speakers in the sense that um, uh, our role is very much one of review, um, and that our parties do represent uh, the policies through the prism of our own own party and the policies that we represent. Um, but I I like to think that uh, the upper house in New South Wales, at least, uh, has a mandate of its own, obviously not to govern but to review because. It's a statewide franchise, and we draw votes from all over the state. Um, it's not just a matter of um, uh, drawing votes from this particular electorate or that particular electorate, and depending on what's happening with the redistribution process as to how many votes we might get or we might lose, as to how many seats we might keep, and there's always a level of bias there. Very much uh, the upper house is driven by uh, the the, the half house election, or as they say, the half senate type election, where um, the members coming up for re-election have to appeal for their for their um, party, <laughs> excuse me, to the whole state. Something in my throat. Um, I think the a government definitely has a mandate, but we also have a responsibility to review the government's le legislative agenda properly and fairly uh, and as i said earlier we view that through the prism of our of our uh, constituents and the people we believe that we represent whether it's shooters whether it's fishers whether it's farmers whether it's rural and regional communities whether it's uh, timber industry greyhound uh, you name it and we think that uh, those people tend by and large especially in rural and regional areas uh, more and more and increasingly looking to our party to see what we can do to to do away with a fair bit of what we've seen, and certainly in this last uh, government, uh, and that is Sydney-centric approach to policy making, and I think to to a large degree that's one reason why we've been quite successful in our lower house campaigns because our our particular party looks very much at everything through through the prism of what's really good for the bush should be good for Sydney, and it's often not presented the other way around. What's good for Sydney very rarely ends up being good for the bush. So uh, th that's the approach we take. And as I say, our, our general purpose as a, uh, a party, but certainly as, as a parliament, uh, the Legislative Council part of the parliament is one of review. Um, we, look, we, look, we look at things through the prism of what our policies are, but not only just policies, what we believe the position, the average person or the average voter 
in rural and regional New South Wales would be looking for us to take to protect their interests. And whether it is in relation to you know, koala policy or whether it's in relation to water policy or whether it's in relation to any of those things, um, we, we, have a fair, we take a fair sounding from time to time in relation to key issues and we have a pretty good feeling for what we think will work and what should work and how we should be advocating in the best interests of those rural and regional areas. Thank you. Um, one final sort of open-ended question from me before I go to some specific ones for each of you. That final open-ended one is this. What's the best thing about being a crossbench member in the Legislative Council and what's the most frustrating aspect of being a crossbench member? Um, Kate, you, Fairman, you haven't started first with one of these. Can I start with you? Is it going to meet with the with uh, the trickiest question. So the best thing, I, I usually, that's this question the, I, that's I end up saying. The staff of the Department of the Legislative Council. Sorry? Uh, other than working with the staff in the department. <laughs> yeah, okay, so we'll get rid of that as, a, as uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the best thing. The committee, process the co committee work is extremely satisfying uh, i chair the um one of the portfolio committees uh in which is the portfolio committee number seven for environment planning and local government uh, it is the committee that did the uh koala inquiry which was an 18 months um inquiry incredibly incredibly valuable uh worthwhile and i think has been has been um in, impactful which we might get to talk about um later so that absolutely is it, it's a privilege to be able to be on any committee be able to sometimes we travel the state we get to meet with many stakeholders and really the the engagement by the community and key stakeholders in that committee process is um yeah, really something to be very grateful for because we, we really do have excellent engagement. So that is, I would think, probably the best. The worst is the, you know, while we only sit, is it 18 weeks given, let's get rid of COVID, but generally it's 18 weeks something. Um, David's nodding, I think, and it's, yeah, give or take, and it's uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays. We have, because we have regional members coming to all travel to Sydney, there is has always been this thing of trying to do as much work in those three days as possible so that regional members can come on Monday, parties can meet and have their various, you know, things that they need to, and then by Thursday night, even if it's a ridiculous time of the night, sometimes people will drive home two to three hours or if they can get a flight, they'll uh, fly, fly home. So it's really unhealthy. That is really unhealthy, that work um, work uh, ethic. I am very keen to change that. In fact, last week I had did a bit of research around what lack of sleep does to the brain, what it does to judgment, what it does to decision-making um, capacity. And I that is the worst thing for me. I'm not um, a mother, thank goodness, so I don't have to worry about any of that. Um, but it's still very, it's just not healthy, the, the hours that we keep. Then, of course, we all of us do a heap of work in the community. It's not like just because we don't have an electorate, we therefore, you know, that's it. We do those three days and that's it. We've got heaps of committee work, as I said. There's just so much there. Plus, you know, we kind of represent the whole state. So I'm, I'm assuming both Robert and Mark do this, but, you know, I get on the road, like, and visit all like around the state, not complaining about that. That's probably another big plus for what I enjoy about the work. But um, yeah, the late, and it wouldn't change any of that, but maybe finishing at, I don't know, eight o'clock instead of midnight, a couple of nights might be uh, useful for us. <laughs> Mr Latham. Uh, Mr Latham, um, the best and the worst of it. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, oh, well, the most most frustrating part is having two votes out of uh, 41. And sometimes you think, you oh, we won that debate, but, you know, we only got two or four, five votes. You know, that's uh, frustrating, of course. Uh, the best part of it, uh, you know, I compare it to when 
I had an electorate and uh, was in a major party, I, I can tell you, uh, um, you know, being a, a, an active constituency member and um, having all the people to hold their hand or, um, you know, um, work out all their problems and issues and needs and so forth in a major party, uh, the, the New South Wales Upper House really frees up your time. You know, I'm, I'm finding that I've got uh, so much more time for uh, research, which is something I've always really loved about politics, um, to really get your teeth into an issue and uh, study it carefully. So, you know, as a lower house member, uh, maybe you've got 20 or 30 percent of your time for research in the upper house. If you if you, if you do it well, you've probably got 60 or 70 percent of your time uh, to get across a whole range of issues because there's, there's only two of us in one nation you know we, we split all the portfolios up um, so there's a, a wide range of interests and, and, and research activities you can pursue and the other thing that uh, I've always enjoyed in, in politics is the parliamentary debate so those debates are, are pretty good in our chamber and I think a lot more active and interesting than the legislative assembly in fact as a minister often tells me he only watches our chamber on the monitor um, and, 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 and says it's at least it's, it's vibrant and active and there are interesting speeches compared to the drudgery of the lower house. So, uh, and if that helps to influence a few things around the building, well, that's a, that's a good thing too. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Borzak. Um, yeah, interesting. I, I enjoy the, um, uh, I enjoy the work in the sense that, uh, I like interacting with uh, constituents. Um, our office is always being hit, um, and not necessarily just when there's a particular campaign on, but we we have all sorts of people coming to our office asking for advice, asking for um, input from us as to uh, how we think they should be handling any particular area of it or issue in their particular area. Um, I like the committee work, although I must admit um, I'm, I'm chair of uh, SC5 Legal Affairs, uh, deputy chair of uh, of the pack and also deputy chair of SC1 and I'm, I've actually bitten off more than I can chew there um, <laughs> I don't doubt uh, we always find ourselves involved actively in campaigns as well uh, even during sitting periods uh, in between elections there's always something interesting going on that we need to be campaigning on um, and uh, there isn't a um, there isn't a uh, uh, I don't know, a week go past or a month ago past where there isn't some issue where we aren't making representations or we aren't campaigning. Um, now that we're involved as a smaller party, now that we're involved in um, lower house uh, campaigning, um, I, th there hasn't been a year since 2015 where we haven't been involved in at least one campaign and obviously in an election year, many campaigns. So that's always taking up a lot of our time. Um, uh, looking at policy, looking at position uh, papers, uh, we do our fair share of that as well. We're always looking at what we can do in that area. Um, I like the uh, the debates. Um, I like hearing from uh, certainly from Mark uh, and also from the Greens. Um, as much as I might disagree with a lot of things being said, it's always interesting to hear the other side and the other point of view. Um, I might not agree with it, uh, and I might believe that they're 100% wrong, but in the end of the day, this is what's really good about our place. There's no one person or no one party as obviously uh, has control of the place and can uh, muffle debate, shorten people's opportunity to spend whatever time they think they have or they've got allocated to them uh, to either move an emotion, uh, move a bill, talk to that bill, unlike the other place where the government totally dominates the time and uh, can uh, ration that out to um, whoever they think they want to favour from time to time. So I think there's there's a lot to like about it um, as far as all those are concerned. I really do love the involvement. Uh, what I what I don't like is the um, the midnight finishes. Um, I don't, I'm not real keen on that. Um, I would ra also rather see a shorter lunch hour and a shorter dinner break and finish an hour and a half or two hours earlier on the nights where we're sitting, especially if we're getting through the business. And the reality also is if the government hasn't got the business to do and it's not a private member's day, well then 
and our private members days are very full now because of the way we've set them up which I applaud then on government members uh, government business day we should think about finishing early anyway so uh, anyway that's that's my two pence worth okay thank thank you all for those contributions uh, really fascinating and I'm probably not allowed to say this as the clerk, but here, here to all, all of those observations about the sitting hours. Um, Rita, I'm sure there are lots of questions coming in from um, uh, our audience. Have I got time to ask another question to our members before I, we go to the audience? Yes, you do. We do have time for another question. It's perhaps a slightly controversial one. You've all spoken about um, working together to hold the government to account in particular, but also to achieve other uh, political outcomes. Um, given we're heading into the last year of the four-year parliamentary term next year, how do you then balance that with differentiating yourselves from one another as we approach the 2023 election? I hope I'm not jinxing you in asking that question. Um, who'd like to go first? Um, I can go quickly because uh, I feel like uh, I feel <laughs> I feel like it's not hard. It's not hard for the Greens to differentiate ourselves from the shooters in One Nation. So from from that perspective, it's probably okay from a from a from a progressive. Uh, the, the the progressive parties, if you like, in the in the upper house, of course, we've got animal justice party as well. That's probably, you know, the, to be honest, us kind of fine tuning a few things there. But even then, I feel like there is enough dif differentiation in terms of what, like, the policy that that we're taking. For us, we'll probably start seeing a bit more of a. I think we've started started to see this anyway, but the kind of proactive, um, say, legislative agenda from a private member's perspective. So looking at so we can introduce private members' bills. Um, there is a fair bit of activity in that in that regard. I've noticed as we're kind of the end, nearing the end of the year, and all of that stuff that we said we would do in a particular year this year is it's all upon us. I think a lot of people are experiencing that in their work and personal lives anyway. So, um, for example, I've got a bill which is for pill testing, which is before the parliament um, this week, the upper house this week. Look, I strongly, I'm not sure, but I, I, I don't think that we will uh, get support for that. But we can use that, for example, in a campaign that, you know, that's kind of something that we would wish to do and i could say the same for a lot of different other issues that we will start um that we already have introduced as as bills so there's also there's achievements as well that we can talk about and we could also i think we're starting to say with the committee process we can start talking about um the achievements and things that the outcomes that we get in parliament for that as well i reckon my sense is coming into this election, um, thinking about it from a yeah from an election. How do we differentiate ourselves? I think there's a lot of wins this time. Like there's a lot of things that we've actually been able to achieve. We've worked really closely. Um, I shouldn't say closely, but well with government to get key amendments through. I think this time we've seen government ministers open to working with every uh, member of the upper house, kind of open to working with every uh, crossbench minor party as well as the opposition on amendments. That's what I have um, found. So sometimes they won't even come to us because they don't need to, you know, they've, they've, they've got support from somewhere else. But um, yeah, there's, there are a lot of, we've got a lot of amendments to a lot of legislation that has come before the upper house this time. And you know, we've improved things, and I think most parties can can say that to to you know to to whatever extent. Um, yeah, we've been pretty effective, so I'm feeling pretty good about uh, how we can message that to the electorate. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Latham. Yeah, as Kate mentioned, there's a natural uh, differentiation across the cross bench. You know, one nation wouldn't share all that much. Our Venn diagram is a bit limited with the Greens and uh, Animal Justice Party. Um, and elsewhere, well, you know, we got we, we we had two members elected from a standing start at the last election, and I'm a great believer in 
in terms of what what support you gather in politics that uh, for election campaigning you know you can't fatten the pig on market day you need to have done your work over the the, the four-year term and uh, you know that work speaks for itself in the eyes of the electorate and, and from our point of view obviously uh, you know we've got no retiring uh, members in the eight-year term for 2023 and, and we'd like to end up with four or five uh, after that election and, and, and a stronger position in the chamber so uh, you know we'll uh, We'll let that uh, unfold and just continue all the things we've been doing. Not worry too much about uh, differentiation as such. It's more the work you do for constituents, the issues of concern that you raise and how you're addressing uh, mainstream concerns that the major parties have overlooked. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Borzak, do you want to add anything on that question? Um, yeah, look, we. We absolutely don't have any trouble differentiating ourselves from any other party. Um, I suppose you could argue that there's a bit of a crossover in support between us and One Nation, that's for sure. But it's not its not a big, uh, direct, competitive crossover, but there definitely is a crossover. Um, we're always working, as I said, we don't, we don't um, start campaigning, as it were, from six months out from the election during the official campaign period we are always on the campaign trail um, uh, covering the issues that we think are important to the, our constituents and we're out there talking to them all the time um, the differentiation i suppose comes really from our point of view between ourselves and for example the national party and uh and country based liberals um, we find that um, there's an increasing appetite uh, in the bush for uh, a different party that has um, a more grassroots approach to not only campaigning but policy that's favouring um, the disadvantaged in the bush, the forgotten people, um, as we call them. And we have been working with that uh, demographic reasonably successfully. Um, we find that, and we have found that um, the current government hasn't been really uh doing enough and that's to our advantage and we find also that labor have largely forgotten uh the working people in the bush as well and we have to work to try to satisfy them we don't uh even though we would say we're a center-right party there's no question of that uh, we're also a party of conservationists not preservationists uh, we're a party that believes that people should be paid a decent wage for a decent day's work uh, and we're keen on making sure that uh, jobs in the bush remain in the bush and that they shouldn't be sacrificed for uh, uh, cheap uh, cheap buyouts for city-based uh, electorates and we're seeing a lot more of that uh, with the um, the current government they're looking to try to protect their city-based votes largely uh, at the cost of their, their rural and regional electorates so differentiating for us is not a difficult thing I don't think and certainly just differentiating on the crossbench, that's not our main target and that's not what we're looking to do. We're looking to differentiate ourselves from the major parties. And at this particular time, that differentiation, of course, really involves us um, being in electoral competition uh, in the upper house vote, but also, of course, in certain lower house votes to try to win their seats off them. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, Rita, um, no, audience talk. questions? Yes, we do have some audience questions uh, and this particular question will actually require some parliamentary memory. Um, so for some, anybody who can jump in on this one, very happy for you too. It's from Ilona and she's questioning whether it's a crossbench like when the, Demo like when the Democrats were in in 1994 when she immigrated to Australia um is crossbench the opposition to the government does it does the crossbench help the government to solve problems that might have something to do with how the crossbench was operating historically speaking we may even get your assistance there um, david on this question if um well when i first started working for the new south wales parliament in 19 90, there were at that time four crossbench members in a legislative council of 45. 
Uh, that was two members of the Christian, well, what is now known as the Christian Democratic Party and two members of the Australian Democrats. And really um, those Australian Democrat members um, together with one of the Christian Democrats really between them sort of held the balance of power and um, really started to be the first assertive crossbench that we saw here in the New South Wales Parliament. Um, I'd actually be interested in Mr Latham's perspectives on that question as a sort of as a noted sort of political historian, but also someone who was there in the federal parliament um, during those days when uh, the Australian Democrats were a significant force in the Senate. Yeah, well, I didn't hang around the Senate too much. They they tended to have the odd good Christmas party, but that was about it. Um, in the, the courtyards of uh, the Parliament House there, but I, I, I suppose the the, the, the big um, uh, the big issue for the Democrats in Canberra was the negotiations to get through the GST package after the 1998 election, which pretty well killed them as a political force. So, you know, we've got to go back over 20 years to to when the Democrats um, in Canberra had a, um, a viable um, way forward. You know, they lost uh, Cheryl Kerno in notorious circumstances uh, when she joined the Labor Party in 1997. And then after the 98 election, they negotiated through what their own supporters thought was a very, very unpopular package of, of GST related reforms. And, and that pretty well killed them off. But I do think it's fair to say that uh, the lasting legacy of the, the Democrats in Australian politics, particularly from a crossbench cross bench point of view, is uh, keeping the bastards honest. You know, I think they probably coined the phrase that's most synonymous with a lot of the work that all crossbenchers do no matter their, 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 sort of their policy outlook, keeping the government honest, sometimes keeping the opposition honest. Uh, that theme is uh, never ending on the crossbench and uh, its manifestation in our chamber now is, is obviously through the SO52 process, which has been highly influential in a whole range of uh, stories, not just about integrity, but policy development and what government gets up to behind the scenes. So, you know, in adding to what our President calls the Daniel Mookie have a looky library. I'm a, I'm a convert to that, and I think it's one of the, the best accountability features of, of our chamber and would surpass anything that you find in Canberra. They have a very active prying committee system in Canberra, but nothing to match our SO52 process, which uh, was quite unparalleled in its reach and significance and, and, and you know, the important work of keeping a government accountable. I have another question here uh, from Bron, and he points to some of the questionable conduct of some politicians or a few politicians, and he would like to know what could be done to keep them more honest, I suppose, but also to keep especially young people more interested in politics because this type of behaviour or this type of Thing that Ron is identifying is alienating people. I'm happy to <clears throat> jump in. I'm not sure in terms of which behaviour um, they are referring to. I don't need obviously specific examples, but there's behaviour. There's there's behaviour. I suppose in terms of personal conduct of a of a kind of disrespectful or disreputable nature, if you like, say being drunk in parliament or being abusive to somebody, then there is the behaviour that is essentially tantamount to, you know, corruption or uh, potential corruption. And they're, they're slightly different, I think, in terms of ways in which to be able to deal with them from a Greens perspective, the way in which we have as as elected representatives and as a party very early on um, made a decision i think from the inception of our party in fact to not accept um, to not accept donations from companies from corporations you know all donations obviously have to um now it's 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 a very very um tight 
uh, tight uh, process at a state level now in terms of what donations can, uh, people can receive anyway. But um, there was uh, Larry Annan, who is a former Greens MP, did a very uh, uh, heap of work around exposing the donations that political parties and individuals were receiving. And the first up was um, developer donations that was reined in as a result of that. That's the kind of history that I remember. And I think from a you know global perspective, getting big money out of politics would have a huge, um, huge influence over the way in which politics are conducted. So I think we see some of the behaviour is around people not really, politicians are not acting in the best interests of their community or the public, um, but are actually um, acting in the best interests of either their you know, people who are influencing them and can get something out of it. That's a big one. And then in terms of in terms of kind of codes of conduct, we have a code of conduct um, as uh, members of parliament in this place. We're looking at ways, even at the moment, around um, we're actively discussing uh, ways in which we can improve that. And so I'm not sure how much I can say in a public forum about those processes, but we certainly um, need more accountability, I think, in terms of the way in which people conduct themselves as opposed to young, sorry, in terms of, I'm conscious of time, in terms of young members, the best thing we could do is try and um, try and get more young people elected to, to politics. You know, we need to represent the community. We aren't diverse. It's uh, shocking in terms of our, um, the diversity broadly from gender to um, culturally and linguistically diverse um, uh, people to First Nations people to younger people. Um, so that we need to do a lot of work um, in that regard. All parties do, I think. I'm sorry, I'm going to jump sorry. in. I know we're, oh, no, that's great. Great response. Um, but there is another question, which I think we could just really slide in there very quickly. Um, what is standing order 52? If somebody can give us an idea before we close off, because we've had mention of it quite a few times tonight. A standing order 52 is a, a call for government papers. In other words, what happens is we give notice that we're going to put a SO52 on and that notice actually says what papers we want the government to supply to us and this is a particular power our house has because of our role in scrutinizing government um, and it can it can cover any and every anything and any, everything um, that the government uh, is involved with and the government's job in answering an SO52 if it's 14 days or 21 days, is to try to give us as little information as they can. That's really what it gets down to. So that's that's where you get the two uh, houses coming, uh, knocking heads. But it's a unique power that uh, the upper house has over the lower house because uh, unless we can actually see what they're up to, uh, you know, politicians don't often, and ministers don't always tell the truth. So uh, sometimes you need to drill down into the government papers to try to find out well what is the truth what is the uh the audit trail if you like the email trail uh the contracts whatever it happens to be uh what actually is happening in the particular area of interest that you may be working on at a, at that time now there is a thing called cabinet and confidence in which case certain papers that are tabled in cabinet simply uh, can be taken as privileged by the government and we can't see them um, and there are two levels also as far as SO2 paper releases are concerned. Uh, there's a general release and then there's a basically a members only release. Uh, that's in a nutshell, that's really all it is. That's all we have time for in a nutshell, I'm afraid. Um, so look, sadly, uh, we all have run out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists. Special thank you to Mr. President and the clerk of the LC for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us. And of course, thank you to you, our audience. I hope you enjoyed the program. Please join us again and visit our website for information about our programs. The Parliament, the Parliament of New South Wales is also on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. So I just want to say good night to everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Rita. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank, thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank <laughs> you.